Okay, just a couple of things for you all at the top. Uh, the president and his entire administration are continuing to engage closely with leaders on Capitol Hill about the need to act quickly on the American Rescue Plan so we can finish the job of getting $2,000 checks out to Americans, so we can get more vaccines in the arms of Americans, so we can get economic relief to families facing eviction or food insecurity, and so we can help reopen schools safely. We're encouraged that both Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Schumer are in full agreement about the need to move swiftly on the President's proposal, and the committee markups we'll see throughout the week are evidence of Congress acting on that expeditiously. Our expectation is that this week's House markups will track closely with what the President has proposed, but there will, of course, be adjustments to strengthen the bill and tweaks as a result of the legislative process, which he's quite familiar with, having served there for 36 years, which is exactly how the process is supposed to work. Uh, we're also going to continue to make the case directly to the American people about the urgency of getting this package across the finish line, including through national and local TV and radio interviews, engagement with hundreds of mayors and county elected officials, consultations with stakeholders across the political spectrum, from labor, labor and rural leaders to the faith community. Here's a quick overview, a number of you have asked about this, uh, of the sense of the scope of our efforts. Over a dozen senior administration officials have conducted over 100 national TV, radio, and podcast interviews to discuss the American Rescue Plan. We've done over 30 local TV interviews in states ranging from Nevada to Louisiana to Pennsylvania. In the last week alone, our legislative affairs team had done more than 300 calls with members and staff on the Hill, including 40 calls with Republicans or bipartisan groups. And you can expect uh, that the President will engage throughout the course of this week with a range of stakeholders, including business leaders, mayors and governors, um, and as we've discussed uh, before, um, this message is resonating. Poll after poll show a bipartisan majority of the American people in support of the President's plan. A couple of other quick updates for all of you. Many folks likely, likely noticed, if you all watched the Super Bowl, the President and the First Lady yesterday appeared in a PSA that aired uh, during the pregame show, thanking health care workers and addressing uh, the importance of continuing to wear masks and getting vaccinations when it's your turn. This is a good example of how you can expect the White House in the coming months to reach out with critical public health messaging as part of an education campaign, meeting Americans where they are on their couches, watching the Super Bowl for yesterday, um, and communicating about the important mitigation steps people can take. Uh, as you, many of you also know, last night during the Super Bowl, President Biden called service members to thank them for their courage, dedication, and service to our nation. He first called troops with Resolute Support Mission in Kabul, and then uh, the USS Nimitz, he then shared via ship broadcasts a message to the nearly 5,000 sailors and Marines who comprise the USS Nimitz crew. Um, with that, uh, let's get to your questions. Go ahead, Alex. Thanks, John. I have two. The first is on your favorite topic, impeachment. Um, does the President have plans to watch any of the trial this week? And does the White House prefer a speedy impeachment trial, or would the President prefer a full airing of the violence at the Capitol and Trump's role in inciting it through things like live witnesses? Well, uh, first, the President uh, himself would tell you that we keep him pretty busy, and he has a full schedule this week, which we will continue to keep you abreast of um, in, as soon as we have more details. But we've already announced his plans to go visit the NIH, to go visit the Department of Defense. Uh, as I noted, he will be engaging with business leaders, mayors, and governors, uh, and of course, continuing to uh, make the case and have conversations with Democrats and Republicans directly about his uh, hopes and plans for the American Rescue Plan moving forward as quickly as possible. So uh, he, I think it's clear uh, from his schedule uh, and from his intention, he will not spend uh, too much time watching the proceedings of any time uh, over the course of this week. Uh, he will remain in closely in touch with Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, a range of officials on the Hill about his plan. And that's exactly uh, what they want him to do, is to remain focused on that. Um, and he will leave the uh, pace and the process and the mechanics of the impeachment proceedings up to members of Congress. And President Biden said there's no need for Trump to receive intelligence briefings. Has Trump requested any? Has he received any? And is that the official decision, or who is that decision left up to? Well, the President said when asked that he there was no need for him to receive them, uh, and he referenced, of course, his erratic behavior, which I think many Americans would agree with him on. 
Uh, he was expressing his concern about former President Trump receiving access to sensitive intelligence. Uh, but he also has deep trust in his intelligence, own intelligence team to make a determination about how to provide intelligence information if at any point the former president requests a briefing. So that's not currently applicable, but if he should request a briefing, uh, he leaves it to Dem to make a determination. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I've been meaning to go to Reuters next, so we'll go for it to you next. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So you mentioned that there will be adjustments, to, or there could be adjustments to sure. the ARP. Uh, one component of that is that was really important as far as the campaign promise was the $15 minimum wage. The president has already signaled that that may not make it into the full package. How important is that measure still to the White House, and how will you get it done? And then also the other uh, thing that came up this weekend is looking at uh, tweaking the level of who gets the stimulus checks. And Janet Yellen mentioned 60,000. Can you explain who gets left out, right? You know, if you get the 60, if you, you know, who is between the 60,000 and the 75,000? Sure. Uh, well, in the first question, uh, the president is remains firmly committed to raising the minimum wage to $15. That's why he put it in his first legislative proposal. And he doesn't, he believes that any American who is working a full-time job trying to make ends meet should not be at the poverty level. And it's important to him uh, that the minimum wage uh, is raised. Um, he was referring this weekend to, as you noted in your question, uh, the parliamentary process. Obviously, it's the most likely path at this point is through a reconciliation process. Uh, there is a, a parliamentarian who will make uh, decisions about what can end up in a final package. And that was certainly what he was referencing uh, in his comments. Uh, in terms of what the options are, uh, it, we'll see what the parliamentarian decides. And then uh, we'll see what additional options are. But we're getting a little ahead of where we are at this point in the process. I'm sure we can continue to have a discussion about it in here. Uh, and then say your second question one more time. 60,000. Sure. Well, one of the pieces that the president has talked about is uh, his openness to engaging and having a discussion about what is called kind of the unofficially called, I guess, the scale up, right? So uh, his proposal, as you know, uh, had proposed uh, uh, $1,400 checks to make the $2,000 uh, whole. Uh, he had proposed kind of a threshold. There's a discussion right now about what that threshold will look like. A uh, conclusion hasn't uh, been finalized. That will be worked through Congress. But either way, his bottom line is that families making $275,000, $300,000 a year may not be the most in need of checks at this point in time. But whatever the threshold is, there will be a scale up. So uh, his view is that a nurse, a teacher, a firefighter who's making $60,000 shouldn't be left without any support or relief either. Uh, it's just a question of sort of where the scale up looks like, what it looks like in a final package. But it's still being negotiated at this point in time. Yeah, the fifteen dollars. You know, it, it, it doesn't make it much harder to get it through if you don't attach it to this COVID relief bill. I mean, does that really? And then the CBO is saying that in fact, if you did go through with it, that you, you know, it would lead to a zero point nine percent reduction in the number of jobs. Well, I, I, I heard about the CBO score as I was walking out here, so I haven't talked with our economic team about that specifically. Um, and at this point in time, it's still working its way through the process in Congress. And the parliamentarian still has to make a determination about what will be in a final package. Uh, oh, I promise I'd go to you first. Thanks, Next, I should say. Go Thank ahead. You. I have a couple questions on COVID, but mm -hmm. I'd like to start with Iran. Sure. Um, President Biden said that the U.S. would not lift sanctions first and that Iran would have to stop enriching uranium um, before negotiations could resume. But since then, the Supreme Leader has said that the U.S. has to act first and roll back sanctions in order to re-engage. Um, is this a non-negotiable point for President Biden? And if so, how do you get out of this stalemate? Well, just to be very clear, the president never said that exactly. It was stated by the interviewer, who Nora O'Donnell, who did the interview, interview, and he didn't respond to the question. So the president's view, position is that if Iran comes back into I full, think he uh, I think if we were an, announcing a major policy change, we would do it in a different way than a slight head nod. But uh, overall, his position has remains exactly what it has been, which is that. If Iran comes into full compliance with its obligations under the JCPOA, uh, the United States would do the same uh, and then use that as a platform to build a larger and stronger agreement that also addresses other areas of concern. And that would, of course, be done with our P5 plus one partners, as it was done uh, when we were putting together the JCPOA in the first place. So what's 
response to Iran's argument that it was actually the U.S. that violated the JCPOA by abandoning it, and therefore it's the U.S.'s burden to re-engage? Well, that, those were actions of the former administration, as you know, uh, and President Biden, of course, was a part of an administration that were, were advocating for the plan to be put together uh, to begin with, but uh, I think his position, the position of our national security team, and the position uh, that he's been in discussion with our partners about, or I should say conveying to our partners, is that it's really up to Iran to be, come back into full compliance and uh, with its obligations under the JCPOA. And uh, at that point, uh, we could move the discussion forward. Thank you. And sure. Can you talk about the concrete steps the administration is doing to target and stop mm -hmm. the spread of the variants we keep hearing about? Um, does that include surging vaccines to areas impacted like South Florida or California with the uh, B117 strain? Well, I know for those of you, and I know we had a lot of briefings today, uh, who had the opportunity to uh, participate in the briefing with some of our medical and health experts. They talked about the importance of not only uh, vac vaccination, uh, g getting the vaccine when you're eligible, uh, that that is a protective step, obviously, and also abiding by a number of the mitigation steps that uh, our health experts have recommended. Uh, but beyond that, I, I don't, I'm not going to go beyond the advice of our health and medical experts at this point in time. Uh, go ahead, Caitlin. Two questions for you. One, on the minimum wage, you're saying it's up to the parliamentarian to make a decision about whether that can be included in here. Of course, we know Senator Sanders said they're still waiting on that. But technically, the vice president could overrule the parliamentarian on this. And it hasn't happened in a long time. But is that an option the White House is considering? Would Vice Pre or would President Biden want Vice President Harris to overrule the parliamentarian to include this in this package? Well, I'm not aware of that being allowed. I I'd certainly take you at your word. I think our view is that uh, the parliamentarian uh, is who is chosen typically uh, to make a decision in a nonpartisan manner uh, in terms of what can be included in a package that goes through reconciliation is the proper process to for this uh, to journey through. When President Biden told CBS that he did not think it was going to survive, what was who had it told him that he it wasn't going to make it through? Likely, well, I, I, the president was uh, in uh, Congress for in the Senate for 36 years. Uh, again, it still has not worked its way through the process, and that can take uh, a bit of time. And we certainly defer to the parliamentarian and members of the House and of the Senate, I should say, to uh, give you a better assessment of what the timeline looks like. Okay, I have another question on impeachment, but just to be clear, sure. so. If the parliamentarian says no, no $15 minimum wage, that's the decision the White House is going with. Well, let's wait and see what they say. And the president remains committed to uh, raising the minimum wage. It's something he talked about on the campaign trail, something he firmly believes in uh, as, a, as a person uh, and as a leader. Uh, but there hasn't been a determination made at this point in time. Okay. And so on impeachment, the president and the White House has not said either way if he believes that former President Trump should be convicted by the Senate in this trial. But if he doesn't believe that he should get access to intelligence briefings, why can't he say whether or not he should be convicted by the Senate? He's no longer in the Senate. He's retired from the Senate, and he's president of the United States. And his focus is on getting relief to the American people. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what he's conveyed publicly, of course, and privately as well. And he'll leave it to his former colleagues in the Senate or members of the Senate to determine the path for it. But doesn't he think that someone, if he believes his behavior is too erratic to get access to intelligence, then doesn't he believe that he should be barred from holding office again? Well, he ran against him uh, because he felt he was unfit for office, and he defeated him. And that's why he's no longer President Trump is no longer president of the United States. So I think his views of the former president are pretty clear, uh, but he's going to leave it to the Senate to see this impeachment proceedings forward through. Uh, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on that question, mm -hmm. uh, it, will the president commit to giving his view once the, the, all the evidence is heard in the impeachment trial? And then secondly, a question on Myanmar. Uh, what is the U.S. doing to uh, perhaps accelerate some of the action we're seeing over the weekend with with protests, and secondly, how concerned is the U.S. about China, which has not stepped in forcefully and is not calling it a coup? Sure. Um, uh, the 
we have been, our national security team has been in touch with a number of our partners and allies. We've obviously, we were outspoken quite quickly um, in the days uh, following the coup, uh, and we named it, designated it a coup very quickly. Uh, in terms of what actions we're taking, there are considerations that are underway or policy processes that are underway on our national security team as we speak. I don't have an update on that today, but at, when we do, we'll certainly make you all abreast of that. And certainly, we are concerned about um, China's um, absence from the conversation and lack of a vocal um, role here. Uh, on the first question, uh, the President was asked about this this morning, and he made pretty clear he wasn't uh, planning to speak to it. So I, again, he's no longer in the Senate, and uh, we put out a statement at the conclusion of the uh, House um, proceedings. Uh, I certainly would consider doing that at the conclusion of the Senate, but I don't expect that he's going to uh, be, you know, posturing or commenting on this through the course of the week. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. I do have a question on both of the first on energy. When is it that the Biden administration is going to let the thousands of uh, fossil fuel industry workers, whether it's pipeline workers or construction workers, who are either out of work or will soon be out of work because of a Biden EO, uh, when it is and where it is that they can go for their green job. And that is something the administration has promised. Uh, there is now a gap. So I'm just curious when that happens, when those people can count on that. Well, I'd certainly welcome you to present your data of all the thousands and thousands of people who uh, won't be getting a green job. Maybe next time you're here, you can well, present no, that. But you said that they would be getting green jobs, so I'm just asking when that happens. Uh, Richard Trumka, who is a friend, longtime friend of mm -hmm. Joe Biden, says, about that day one Keystone EO, he says, I wish he, the president, had paired that more carefully with the thing that he did second by saying, here's where we are creating the jobs. So there's partial evidence from Richard Trumka. Well, you didn't include all of his okay. interview. How Would about, you like okay. to include the rest? So, so how about this? Uh, the Laborers International Union of North America said the Keystone decision will cost 1,000 existing union jobs and 10,000 projected construction jobs. Well, what Mr. Trumpaga also indicated in the same interview was that President Biden has proposed a climate plan with transformative investments in infrastructure and laid out a plan that will not only create millions of good union jobs, but also help tackle the climate crisis. And as the President has indicated when he gave his prime time address uh, to talk about the American Rescue Plan, he talked about his plans to also put forward a jobs plan uh, in the in the weeks or months following. I and mean, he has every plan to do exactly that. But uh, there are people living paycheck to paycheck. There are now people out of job once the Keystone pipe out of jobs once the Keystone pipeline uh, stopped construction. It's been twelve days since Gina McCarthy and John Kerry were here and it's been nineteen days since that EO. So what are these people who need money now? When do they get their green job? Well, uh, the, the President and many Democrats and Republicans in Congress believe that investment in infrastructure, building infrastructure uh, that's in our national interests uh, and that boosts the U.S. economy, creates good paying union jobs here in America and advances our climate and clean energy goals are something that we can certainly work on doing together. And he has every plan to uh, share more about his uh, details of that plan in the, in the weeks ahead. And then just a quick one on the stimulus. There's reporting that House Democrats are going to come out with a $3,000 per child stimulus for mm -hmm. some eligible families. Is that something that the White House supports making a permanent benefit? Well, the President talked about this uh, a bit on the campaign trail and the importance of um, child tax credits uh, to help working families um, ensure they can make an ends meet. This proposal is emergency funding, as I understand it. Uh, it's a central priority of his first legislative proposal to cut child poverty ha in half in in the first, this year, sorry. Um, and that's why he included a child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan. Uh, but that's, again, emergency funding and something that will help people get through this period of time. Okay, go ahead. So to follow up Peter's question. Sure. What's this White House's stance on a universal basic income? This idea of the government giving out the regular checks on a routine basis to Americans who might need it. I know that's been proposed by a number of people, including some on the presidential campaign trail. Um, I don't have anything more for you on it. I'm happy to check with our economic team if that's uh, something that they're looking at at all. As a corollary, do you agree with the need that, that many on the Hill, and not just Democrats, are expressing that there ought to be these enormous, well, no, I won't say enormous, but $3,000 or $4,000 per child checks for families right now? 
I, as I tried to just indicate, I mean, the President supports uh, the proposal uh, that uh, Representative Neal and others have put forward to uh, ensure that there is um, uh, money in the, in the package that helps bring relief to families in the form of a child tax credit. That's something he certainly would support. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jen. I, I have two questions. Uh, one of the other things that Secretary Yellen said yesterday is that the President is open to a mandate on uh, family leave and child care. Is there a timetable on that? Uh, I don't have any more uh, details or a timetable uh, for you. Uh, certainly, as a father himself, uh, this is an issue that he has spoken about in the past. Um, but uh, I don't have any more details at this point in time. And also, yesterday, uh, did the President or did the White House have any concern about what we all saw on uh, a TV from Tampa about the, the thousands of people out uh, celebrating and without masks. Any concern there? Um, certainly. I mean, the president, I haven't spoken with him specifically about the events of this weekend, but, you know, he did a PSA yesterday with Dr. Biden making clear that social distancing, that mask wearing, that getting the vaccine when you have the opportunity to get the vaccine are vital steps to keeping uh, more Americans safe uh, and saving more lives. Uh, and certainly uh, we know the Super Bowl looked not like different from what it has in the past. And he also conveyed that he's hopeful that next year will be a moment where everybody can celebrate and party. But he is, of course, concerned when there are pictures and photos, we all are, uh, that show many, many people without masks um, in close distance with one another at the height of a pandemic. Go ahead. Um, John, I have two questions. First, um, President Biden said in, in the CBS interview that um, he hasn't spoken to President Xi yet because he hasn't had an occasion to talk to him. There's no reason not to call him. But has there been, is it is it actually part of the strategy to not call him yet and to hold off on that in hopes of kind of sending a message to China that, that, that you know, President Biden is not going to, you know, try to work, you know, really hard to curry favor? Is there, is there something happening there? Not. Well, uh, part of our strategy is to um, consult closely with our partners and allies. And you saw we did readouts of these calls over the past week or so that he spoke, the president spoke with the prime minister of Japan. He spoke with the prime minister of South Korea. He spoke with the prime minister of Australia. And um, China was, of course, uh, an important topic of conversation during those conversations. He also discussed China with, uh, in calls with his European allies thus far. So part of our strategy is certainly engaging with uh, partners in the region uh, and allies uh, and doing those calls and engagements first, and also having consultations with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill. Uh, we've only been, I know I can't say this forever, but we've only been here two and a half weeks. Um, he has not called every global leader uh, yet. He's not had engagements with all of them, and uh, I'm sure he will uh, do more of that in the weeks ahead. Putin, who is somebody who is not quite an ally. Um, Certainly not. So, so yes. um, and that was more than a week ago at this point. So yes, but he, but he had that conversation in part because there was a timeline for New Start and the deadline that was approaching with New Start. And during that conversation, he made very clear uh, that there are uh, significant concerns he has, the administration has, about uh, the reported actions of the Russian government. Uh, but for the most part, his other calls have been with partners and allies in the region, in, in Asia, and in, in Europe as well, at this point in time. Um, and then on something else, uh, Ron Klain said on January 21st that the administration was going to try to build what he described as a national clearing house for information about the COVID vaccine. Um, is something like that being built um, in the administration? And if so, how long do you think that's going to take? I think people are really struggling to find information about their state, their county. Um, and, you know, there's just so, there's so much difficulty in, in the vaccination process. You're, you're right. There's a great deal of confusion. Um, and one of the uh, focuses we have had is trying to um, alleviate that confusion. And part of that has been through working with uh, governors and local elected officials. One of their biggest requests has been to have more of a 
heads up on how much vaccine supply there would be, of course, to increase vaccine supply. We've worked to do both to give ensure uh, that there is three planning time for vaccine allocation, increases in allotments as supply allows, uh, and of course, deploying government resources to sites where they are needed. Um, we're looking at a host of measures uh, that could help us achieve our goal, of course, of getting 100 million vaccines in the arms of Americans in the first 100 days and also ensuring that we're reaching uh, communities where there are higher uh, levels of vaccine hesitancy. Um, but uh, the president and the president has directed his team to do, use whatever tools and resources necessary to get the job done. So there are a range of options under consideration, but I don't have any updates for you on that particular uh, proposal. Uh, certainly, a lot of people would love that, but we're we're looking to prioritize how we can be most impactful as quickly as possible, and working with states and governors to make those determinations. Uh, go ahead, Anne. Uh, thank you. Uh, back on impeachment, sure. uh, you mentioned that uh, the president will be in close contact uh, with Senator Schumer. Do you expect that to be daily? Uh, have they, for example, have they spoken since he's gotten back uh, from Delaware? Do you, like, will that be a regular way that, that the president is briefed on, on the progress uh, of the impeachment trial? I don't expect that would be a primary topic. I actually expect it would be more about uh, the American Rescue Plan and progress being made on that front. There are, of course, uh, markups uh, happening this week, more on the House side. Uh, and the president has remained in close touch with Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer very regularly uh, over the course of the last few weeks. And I expect that would continue. Do you expect that they will have any strategy discussions at all of, 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 as the trial is unfolding? I don't expect that would be a primary point of discussion of their conversations. You, you said that he's, not, he's busy and he's not going to be uh, spending moment by moment uh, attention to it this week. But uh, will he get a daily update or perhaps more frequently than that uh, from White House staff? I don't expect that will be a primary focus for him this week or of his senior staff either. Another foreign policy question sure. following on Lisa's question of, about Iran. Uh, when the president ruled out uh, dropping U.S. sections uh, it immediately, uh, he didn't then go on and and talk about some of the other strategies that are that are out there, including, for example, that the United States might drop its objections to Iran receiving an IMF loan, uh, COVID-related IMF loan. Uh, there are a couple other ideas mm -hmm. that would allow Iran to get some uh, economic benefit. That, that would not be sanctions and maybe grease the wheel for negotiations. Does the president have a view on, that, on those strategies and were they part of the discussion uh, at the uh, principals meeting on Friday? I, I'm not going to rule. I read out a principals meeting, which was primarily focused on a range of issues in the Middle East. Of course, Iran was a topic of discussion, uh, or was, was expected to be a topic of discussion. I think during the interview, the president was asked about uh, whether he would uh, roll back sanctions, and he conveyed, no, that it's the ball is in Iran's court. It wasn't a more extensive conversation than that during the interview, um, and that's long been his position. So that really is the next step in terms of engagement um, with Iran uh, from here it out necessarily, that, that there might be other ways to, to uh, sort of help Iran get back to the table that would be short of dropping U.S. sanctions? Uh, well, again, I think his view is that uh, the ball is in Iran's court to uh, come back into full compliance with the JCPOA, and that that would be uh, the basis for uh, the United States doing the same and then using that as a platform to build a longer and stronger agreement. Uh, but that is really the next step in his view in the process. I have one more very quickly mm -hmm. on the post office, if, if, if I could. Um, on time, uh, first class mail delivery dropped to 38% mm -hmm. in uh, December of this year from 92% the year before. Does the president have a view on whether the Postmaster General should keep his job? And uh, if he would like to see the Postmaster General removed, would he move to change the makeup of the governing board that could make that happen? Well, as I understand it, there are a number of openings right now on the governing board of the post office, um, or vacancies, I should say, that would, of course, work their way through a personnel process. Um, I don't think I have anything more for it on this for you, but uh, I can follow up with our team and see what more we can report out. Go ahead. Um, back on the subject of the COVID checks, 
Bernie Sanders said it would be absurd to lower the threshold, um, the income threshold, and some other Democrats have raised the prospect that doing so could lead to a political backlash given voters in Georgia were explicitly promised this aid by the president and they didn't really have any reason to believe that fewer people would qualify for that aid under the Democrats' plan. Um, so I'm wondering if that's something you guys are concerned about um, and how you would address um, that criticism. Well, uh, the president proposed uh, the $1,400 checks to make to, to come, plus 600 is of course $2,000 because he was fe felt it was important and vital to get that direct relief to as many Americans as possible and target that relief to the Americans who need help the most. And that's how his original plan and proposal was designed. Uh, he's also said, and I've said many times from here, that the final plan will look different from what the plan he proposed in his joint session address. It's still working its way through Congress, and uh, I don't think a conclusion has been uh, made yet on the exact level of targeting. And when it does, we're happy to have a conversation about that. But part of this is, is uh, you know, an opportunity for members of both parties and members of, who are across the political spectrum, of course, even in the Democratic Party, to weigh in on what the path forward should look like. Go ahead in the back. Thank you, Jen. A uh, little bit of follow-up on the Iran and China question. Uh, what does President Biden consider uh, the biggest threat to the U.S. national security? Overall in the world? Yes. Uh, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm going to define that for you in this moment. There are a range of threats that he's talked about uh, in the past, um, and I'm sure he'll have more to say on his national security approach and strategy in the, in the weeks ahead. I have one question. Uh, last week, a uh, report made by NGOs and universities was sent to the White House recommending that the United States break negotiations on trade and others with Brazil over climate and human rights violation. And likewise, some Democrats on the Hill already had expressed the same uh, opposition to expand economic, uh, economic partnership with Brazil. Is the White House paying attention to those reports and to what's happening in Brazil? Oh. We certainly are paying close attention to uh, what is happening uh, in Brazil. Uh, obviously, uh, we share a vibrant partnership that spans two centuries of mutual interests and shared values. Um, and we, um, you know, have even announced in recent days, uh, you know, on, on February 5th, the United States government through the U.S. Uh, through USAID announced it has delivered an additional $1.5 million in emergency COVID response in Brazil. Um, and we, of course, uh, remain, um, you know, closely engaged in these in what is a significant economic uh, relationship. Um, uh, we are by far the largest investor in Brazil, including in many of Brazil's most innovative and growth-focused companies, and we'll continue to strengthen our economic ties and increase our large and growing trade relationship in the months ahead. But Jen, the policies of uh, the, the Brazilian president and President Biden on the many issues, climate. Um, gay rights, uh, other, st other ones, are very different. Mm -hmm. How can they work together? Well, just as is true in many of our relationships, we look for opportunities to work together on issues where there is um, joint national interest, uh, and obviously there's an, a significant economic relationship, and we will uh, not hold back on areas where we disagree, whether it's climate or human rights uh, or, uh, or otherwise. And so that will be uh, the path forward with our relationship with Brazil as well. Go ahead, Yamish. Thanks so much. Uh, a few questions. The first is, what should Americans take away from the fact that President Biden campaigned on unity, talked about unity, got into office about two weeks in, has decided all but it decided, it seems, to go with a process where Democrats can pass a $1.9 trillion plan without the support of Republicans. I know that there are Republicans across the country that the White House is pointing to saying they support this bill, um, but there is this, there is the fact that Democrats don't have to have Republican support in Congress for this bill, and the President is seemingly supporting that process. So I'm wondering what people should take away from that. And, Will that definition of bipartisanship be the one that, that is going forward with this White House? Well, the president ran on unifying the country, not on creating one political party. But I will note that uh, 16 of the last 21 reconciliation bills that have gone through Congress have been bipartisan. 
And certainly, uh, there's opportunity for Republicans to not only offer amendments as it's going through the House committee process, and then we'll go through the Senate committee process following that, but they will have the opportunity to, of course, vote for a package that will, that the vast majority of the American people support. Uh, so, uh, you know, the president is, is, his first priority is getting relief to the American people. Uh, but the vast majority of the public, Democrats, Republicans, independents are with him in that effort. There's a long history of bipartisan support for reconciliation bills, a parliamentary process. Again, I don't think the American people are particularly worried about how the direct relief gets to their, into their hands. Uh, and you know that if that's the process that uh, mo it moves forward through, which seems likely at this point, the president would certainly support that. I have a question also on um, impeachment. I know the president, you say, isn't going to be watching it, but there are going to be millions of Americans who will be watching it. I wonder what the president's message is to Americans, especially the ones that are still mourning the loss of, of people who died in the Capitol, who are still wondering whether or not the president, former President Trump, will be possibly acquitted in the in this trial even if he even if Biden doesn't want president Biden doesn't want to say whether or not president Trump should be convicted i just wonder if the white house has any message to americans who are gearing up for could what could be a tumultuous and traumatic two weeks well the president's focus is on delivering what those millions and millions and millions of americans care deeply about which is getting the pandemic under control putting 10 million, Amer you know, putting millions of Americans back to work, getting vaccines in the arms of Americans, reopening schools. And uh, he has been clear that he v views the events of January 6th as a horrific attack on our democracy. He put out a statement, we put out a statement from him, I should say, when the House voted, uh, but he's going to leave it to the Senate to determine the path forward here. Uh, that doesn't change, uh, you know, and, and his view is that he was elected to uh, deliver on uh, the promises he made on the campaign trail. So that's what he's going to keep his focus on in the weeks ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Yamish. Saying that the GOP can offer amendments, um, that doesn't mean that they have to listen to them or accept them. So I wonder then if Republicans um, have to just accept what the Democrats have approved. I just wonder if you could talk a bit more about this definition of bipartisanship, because there is this, I know you're saying that Democrats and, and are giving Republicans the opportunity, but there's still this, this idea that Democrats are, are in two weeks in are going it alone. Well, again, uh, 16 of 21 reconciliation bills in the past have received bipartisan support. And the ideas in this package, the proposals in this package have broad support from Democrats, Republicans, and independents um, across the country. So I would pose the question back to Republicans. Why aren't you supporting what the vast majority of the public supports? Um, I'll leave it at that. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Thoughts. Go ahead. Completely, completely yeah, it's okay. But we can switch topics. It's fine. Go ahead. A completely different topic, which is Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin wrote his first memo on January 23rd um, that the president had ordered a 90-day commission to pursue solutions to sexual assault in the military. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about if that's a White House commission, a defense commission, uh, who picks the commissioners, anything more you can say about that commission that's supposed to be looking at sexual assault in the military. Uh, I believe it's a commission at the Department of Defense. It's certainly an initiative the President of the United States supports, but I would send you to the Department of Defense for more specifics about the timeline and membership. Go ahead. With the, the, some of the crises that the nation has faced in recent months, you've got mm -hmm. COVID, more than 400,000 Americans dead, January 6th, the attack on American democracy. There have been calls for a 9-11 style commission to write the official histories of those events. Would, is that something the President would support? Of the COVID commission? Or 9-11. I'm sorry, or January 6th, rather. Uh, well, uh, you know, a determination of that kind would be made by Congress, as you well know. Um, and his focus at this point in time is on uh, addressing the crisis in this moment, right? Which is uh, ensuring that more Americans get shots in their arms, that we are getting the pandemic under control. Uh, there has been a report by HHS looking at the prior administration's handling of the COVID uh, crisis, and we've also not held back in areas where we felt that um, it was handled in a way that um, impacted the lives of millions. Uh, so, uh, but at this point in time, our focus is really on getting the pandemic under control, and we'll leave that decision up to Congress. Go ahead. Uh, two quick ones. Uh, one news of the day: Has President Biden reached out to anybody from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? And if not, is that something that's going to happen today? 
very exciting, uh, the outcome of the Super Bowl, I guess, if you're a fan of the Buccaneers. But um, we will be inviting. I don't have an update for if it's happened yet, but I do have an update that, that we look forward to inviting the Buccaneers as well as the 2020 NBA champions, the Lakers, to so the White House when it is COVID safe. Um, but I don't know when that will take place yet. Thank you. And on immigration, there's some new reporting that ICE uh, is going to get some new guidance to no longer focus on deporting illegal immigrants who have been convicted of DUI, simple assault, solicitation, drug-based crimes, among other things. And I'm curious how that is in the interest of public safety. Well, uh, first, it's uh, guidelines that would be uh, put out by the Department of Homeland Security, and I'd certainly send you them. They have a confirmed secretary now, uh, but uh, the priority for the enforcement of an immigration laws uh, will be on those who are posing a national security threat, of course, a public safety threat, and on recent arrivals. Nobody is saying that DUIs or assault are acceptable beha behavior, and those arrested for such activity should be tried and sentenced as appropriate by local law enforcement. But we're talking about the prioritization of who is going to be deported from the country. And more broadly, would this be what Biden was talking about in the debate where he said in the Obama administration uh, they didn't do enough to reform the immigration system? Because he was just vice president, but that if he was president, things would change. Is this the kind of change that he was talking about? Well, I think the kind of change he was talking about was uh, putting forward an immigration bill at a time where modernization of immigration is long overdue that addresses not only a pathway to citizenship, but puts in place smart security measures and addresses the root causes of these issues in the country's uh, in Central America. So I think that's primarily what he was referring to, but also prioritization, which again would be up to the Department of Homeland Security uh, to ensure our focus is on the individuals who pose the greatest national security threat is also something he's long supported. Uh, go ahead, Caitlin. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you seem to be saying this, but I just want it to be clear. Yeah. President, former President Trump has not requested any intelligence briefings, right? Not, not that I'm aware of, but you, I would point you to the uh, intelligence community and the ODNI for more specifics. And to follow up on that, why is, is there a reason Morgan Muir is no longer leading President Biden's daily intelligence briefings? I believe he's overseeing uh, the process yeah, of preparing cool. materials, uh, but I don't have any more details. I'd point you to ODNI and I on that as well. Okay, so there's no reason you know that he's not leading the in-person briefings. He, he's assembling the daily brief. He's yeah. not leading them in person. Which, which is, is a works. very important role to play and very, uh, very labor-intensive, uh, but I would point you to them for more specifics on the briefings and who will be providing the briefings. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I have two questions. One's a quick follow-on impeachment. Sure. Aside from the particulars of this case, does President Biden think it's constitutional to impeach and convict a former president who is no longer in office? I'm just not going to have any more for you on weighing in on impeachment. I appreciate the, it's a big story, um, but our focus is on the American Rescue Plan and uh, delivering for the American people. Got it. I, I do have a COVID, yep. COVID crisis related question. Go ahead. Um, because the attacks in the Asian American community continue to rise and over the weekend, there were some videos that went viral because elderly Asian Americans mm -hmm. were really attacked and um, in, a, in a way that is difficult to watch. And I wonder, other than the presidential memorandum, is President Biden going to take any further actions to address this problem? Um, or And has he seen the videos? I'm not aware that he's seen the videos, but he is concerned about the discrimination against the actions against the Asian American community, which is why he signed the executive order and why he's been outspoken and making clear that, um, you know, attacks, verbal attacks, any attacks of any form are unacceptable and we need to work together uh, to address them. Uh, but. Uh, obviously, the executive order is something he did very early in his administration. It's still early, but even earlier, um, because he felt it was so important to put a marker down. Is there anything more that can be done, like offer DOJ or FBI assistance to local law enforcement authorities? I mean, I, I, I'd certainly defer to, you know, we would support, of course, uh, additional action on a local level, a federal level, but I would send you to DOJ or FBI for any further specifics Thank on that. You. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. Thank you.